I'm pretty excited to be here. I'm an urban designer on principal at O2 Planning Design, and uh, I just uh, left the TCAD steering committee because I moved to Calgary. So I'm happy to be back here uh, and presenting this uh, or uh, moderating this session on uh, on New York City. And I'm sure everybody's seen what's been going on in New York City in the last 10 years. It's going to be great to have these two presentations because we're going to see a little bit more about how they sell their complete streets and document record them and then drill down on, on and how they get the pedestrian uh, level impl implement, implemented. Uh, and so we have Sean Quinn and Heidi Wolf here. I'm going to introduce them both first and then they can come up. And we're going to do the questions the same way. I think we might just stand up because there's so few people in the room. Uh, to ask the questions at the end. So, uh, Mr. Quinn is a co-director of the New York City's Department of Transportation Pedestrian Projects Group. Uh, he's eight years of experience in pedestrian planning, design, and implementation in New York and New Jersey. And over the past seven years at New York City Department of Transportation, he's successfully implemented projects which have redesigned streets with an eye towards safety and mobility and economic development. He was also the project manager for the Green Lights of Midtown, which closed portions of Times Square to vehicle traffic, and has authored several reports for the agency as a master's degree in city planning from Rutgers. So uh, first we're going to hear from Sean. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for having me here and us here up to Toronto. This is my first time to the city. and. Um, having a great time. I've seen a lot of great things. I um, feel like we don't have much to tell you anymore. You guys are doing such a great job. It's amazing. Um, so I've been working at the Pedestrian Projects Group for seven years at New York City DOT. I began um, right after our former commissioner uh, started, um, Jeanette Sadekan, and through that time I've um, worked on several pedestrian projects throughout the city. And in doing so, we found that um, you know, in thinking about pedestrians, we're not really only thinking about pedestrians. We began having to think about every mode, all modes, and in order to get the most successful projects, we had to design with all modes in mind. So, um, I put together this presentation with that in mind, how, how pedestrian projects um, have developed into becoming projects really for all users. Um, the goals of New York City Department of Transportation's Pedestrian Projects Group are to increase safety, improve pedestrian network and accessibility, maintain mobility for all users, and enhance the walking experience, quality of life, and local economy. Um, the, throughout the presentation, I'm going to uh, have these uh, key at the bottom of each slide that points out uh, through a series of before and after photos, um, those four goals and how they were met in each project. So in the project um, here on Fifth Avenue, you can see we had an overly wide roadbed um, up in Upper Manhattan that had a set of housing projects on the left side of the screen, schools and libraries on the right side of the screen, and not any, uh, no real amenities for pedestrians using the space. Um, so by adding this pedestrian island, narrowing moving lanes, um, adding some daylighting, and creating uh, turning lanes and clarifying the moving lanes for all vehicles. We're able to um, enhance that space uh, for the pedestrians while maintaining the mobility for the users and then creating some amenities uh, for the neighborhood. Um, the New York City Department of Transportation um, has about 12, um, sorry, New York City is uh, 470 square miles, and within that, there are 6,000 miles of roads that we have to deal with. Um, there are 12,700 intersections that are signalized in the city. Um, and of those intersections, the Protection Projects Group only gets to handle about 20 projects a year. Those projects range from things that are from large to small. So this screen actually shows a wide range of those projects. Um, from adding mid-block crosswalks with amenities um, in Midtown to closing a slip lane in the financial district to create a new pedestrian space across from the ferry terminal to closing large roads, uh, portions of Broadway in front of Herald Square in Midtown. For each of these projects to be successful, 
we do a series of before and after analysis, um, looking to make sure that we met the goals that I reach, uh, mentioned on the slide before. So we're looking for safety, how we improve safety, how we maintain or improve mobility um, with each project, and how we improved uh, economic vitality and the quality of life within each project. So by doing this analysis, not only are we able to show the impact of each project, we're also able to then sell the project uh, further down the line as we continue to do these 20 projects a year. Um, our unit is one unit within the agency of 4,500 people. Um, we're not the only one doing these projects. There's about five or six units that do um, a Approximately 100 small to large scale projects a year in the city. Um, and these days we are working under the goals of reaching Vision Zero, which is the new policy under uh, our current mayor, which uh, hopes to bring pedestrian and traffic fatalities down to zero uh, in the coming decades. Currently, the city has uh, 4,000 seriously injured uh, pedestrian and drivers a year um, and 250 fatalities a year. So 250s are low. Um, from 10 years ago, we were up uh, way higher than that. We hope to get that 250 down to zero in the coming decades, like I mentioned. Um, so for those, those projects, doing the analysis, getting us uh, to vision zero is key because we have these sort of uh, goals in mind and we have the analysis that shows that this is, this is working. Um, so we do. From small to large, like I was mentioning, we do typical designs on our streets that include things like neck downs, pedestrian islands, chicanes, and medians and buffers throughout the city. So here, um, on each project I highlight, I'm also going to put one piece of data that we found after that project. Every project has um, several pieces of after data, but I'm going to throw up one for each. Um, in this project in the Upper West Side, we use typical designs of uh, painted neck downs to shorten the crosswalks, a buffer and chicane designed to um, narrow an overly wide road um, that was built as part of a um, Robert Moses development um, in, back in the 50s. Um, and by doing that, we were able to reduce crashes in this intersection by 20%. It's a very easy, very simple solution to this intersection. Not only did it help pedestrians, but it helped slow down vehicles making the turns, and it helped slow down the speeding of vehicles who were using that corridor. In this project in Brooklyn on Barinquin Place, we were able to take a design that had been implemented using some of the uh, typical bike lane and uh, painted buffer treatments and upgraded even further uh, with other items in our toolkit by adding a pedestrian uh, safety island. Um, we added several new crosswalks by studying the signal timing at that intersection, which allowed us to add those crosswalks. And we closed the slip. You can see in the top there was a right turn slip. We were able to close that slip and create a uh, pedestrian amenity in this neighborhood that's uh, rapidly growing. Um, and since we put uh, those sort of enhanced enemies, uh, uh, amenities on top of our already typical design, uh, we were able to reduce pedestrian in, uh, injuries along the corridor by 67%. On top of that, they got new green, uh, green um, trees, uh, landscaping, planters, and uh, anything I show um, going forward uh, with plantings and green space, we have maintained by either a local partner or by our Department of Parks. So those partnerships are key in uh, providing and enhancing the exper uh, experience in these neighborhoods. On a larger scale, um, and here's an example in Park Circle of where we're thinking bigger on a larger scale, we look for underutilized roadbed. Um, this, even though it looks in the top left photo like a, uh, a highway street, it's actually in the smack dab in the middle of the neighborhood at the bottom of Prospect Park. Um, the highway scale of this traffic circle was cutting the neighborhood off from accessing the park. Um, so when we find these intersections, our, our unit is very good at finding the intersections that are the most complicated intersection and figuring out what to do with them. Um, so we look for underutilized roadbed uh, connections that are lost in the neighborhood, and an uninviting street, streetscape. And here, we are able, by using paint on the road, to clarify the moving lanes, add crosswalks, add bicycle facilities, um, and then enhance it with new concrete amenities for pedestrian safety. We created a service road um, so that the locals not only got to keep their parking, but we added parking, uh, which 
is a rarity in New York City. Um, and we enhanced the, the park gateway by adding these planted uh, amenities. The other thing about this project, besides bicycle and pedestrian connections, is that we actually provided a horse connection. Um, so it's a true complete street. Um, we thought of even the horses as they move from the stable, which is on this side of the circle, across the center of the circle into the park. So we actually developed a stamp, a horse stamp, and painted the road uh, a truffle color and created a bike lane and then the horse lane with the horse stamps in it to get them to the park. Um, in this project, we did have a slight reduction, very slight reduction in overall travel times through the circle and through the neighborhood, um, but the benefits here outweigh the, uh, the slight reduction in travel time, and that's something that we always have to sell with folks, and that in the long run, um, some of these things might um, take a couple extra minutes to get through the neighborhood, but they're getting all of these other um, positives. Madison Square, this is an old one, but we like to talk about it a lot because it um, was a giant tangle of roads in the middle of the neighborhood. Um, there was lack of connections from major roadways, Fifth Avenue and Broadway, long crossings, complicated signal timing, and uh, basically a concrete jungle in this uh, um, burgeoning neighborhood. We are able to uh, close some of those roadways, build better connections, build a bicycle connection, and create a uh, iconic pedestrian plaza in the middle of Midtown uh, just by rethinking how the road was used, rethinking the traffic patterns, and doing an intense traffic study. I should mention with all of our projects we do, we have engineers on staff that actually do the before and after analysis so that not only are we confident it's going to work, we're also able to sell it to the community um, that we're, we're not just taking away lanes willy-nilly. Um, in this project we were able to get a lot of um, benefits while still operating at a level of service of C. Um, and the other thing is that we were able to, um, we take full credit for it, but the, the building values increased 22% um, in this neighborhood compared to 4% borough-wide. Um, and we've done a lot of this analysis now too on the economic scale. We have a report you can find on our website where you can um, see other case studies similar to um, showing similar data to this economic uh, impact. On Delancey Street is an example of how we had this very long crosswalk. I think Professor Cooper showed a, uh, my former professor, I should mention, um, showed a photo of this, uh, this exact interchange earlier. Um, here we were thinking about the pedestrians. There was a girl killed crossing the street, unfortunately, um, several years ago, and we needed to figure out a way to shorten the crosswalks um, at this heavily trafficked um, interchange. Um, and in doing that, we're, we looked at how the traffic was coming off the bridge, saw that all this traffic was forced to turn right anyway out of returning lane. A lot of them cheated um, and continued through. And then there's this very underutilized service road. So by rethinking the turn lane and that service road and how they actually had the function, they didn't have to have full access to Delancey Street, we were able to create this large painted neck down maintained by a partner, shorten the crossing distance. We are also able to do some things with the signal timing to allow pedestrians to have more crossing time at that location. Uh, crashes on this corridor reduced by 21% after the project. We also touched about 15 other intersections along the corridor as we went. On Adam Clayton Powell on the Upper West Side, we had uh, a new sort of um, policy that we, we like to look at these larger arterials where we look for creating two good lanes or three good lanes versus whatever was there before. So you can see in the top left photo, there is three lanes that were undefined, people weaving back and forth, the left turners would stand on the median, um, through vehicles would get behind them, there was a lot of back pressure, no one really knew what to do, there was double parking on the left side of the street, um, but it was just marked with two uh, or three uh, dash lines. Um, but by organizing the road, like in the bottom photo, um, we were able to create two good lanes that function for the through traffic. Um, we made a left turn lane along the, the median, which allowed us to pull out the pedestrian space and capture the pedestrian space in the shadow. This is something I think a lot of municipalities can do on these sort of wider roadbeds. Think of where you can capture the shadow of a turn bay, uh, forcing traffic to get into the lanes they're supposed to get into. And then we created a wide parking lane, which allows for flexibility for uh, cycling on the corridor. Um, and uh, yeah. I was going to say double parking, but I don't like to say that because that's counterproductive to keep 
slightly, but that does happen there, and then the double parkers are out of the moving lane. Um, and then our toolkit, which um, is something that uh, the pedestrian projects group actually innovated for uh, the New York City Department of Transportation in 1997. We started creating these temporary ways to make projects, and then from 1997 to 2007, we did nothing with it because we didn't have the innovative leadership that we had um, in 2007. We began to put out this toolkit to create these projects to reach our goals sooner than later. Our capital projects usually take from anywhere from five to 10 years, um, and this allows us to reach the goals um, today. Um, in this project in Union Square, you can see a lot of those um, uh, toolkit pieces in play. Planters, painted space, uh, new signal timing, bicycle and pedestrian connections on the top of Union Square Park. We even removed the lane on Broadway here, adding a buffer bike lane, and we're able to maintain southbound vehicle volume on the corridor. Other items in our toolkit include signage, signal timing, left turn signals. We have LPIs, a new type of leading pedestrian interval, where we actually split it, and it's a flashing yellow light, allowing the through traffic to get the green ball. The turning traffic is held. Then it turns flashing as they turn over the pedestrian, so it's a way to move through traffic while holding uh, turning traffic to give the pedestrians a benefit. We have different colors of paint that we've tested. We have our painted, uh, our gravel that we use um, to make things look a little bit fancier than just our normal truffle paint. Our typical concrete pedestrian islands with trees maintained by the Parks Department. Um, all this stuff is done in-house. We don't have contractors except for our markings crew. Everything else is done in-house, so we save a lot of money doing this. Um, and then we have our plaza amenities, folding tables and chairs, planters. Um, we have granite blocks and various other types of edge treatments, that, um, including the planters that keep the spaces secure. Um, at first, when we started implementing these, people were afraid of sitting in these spaces because they wouldn't feel secure, but we, you know, we really bulked up the items we put on the edge. Those blocks are actually um, taken off of our Willis Avenue bridge when we refaced it five years ago. We saved all the blocks from the original construction in the yard, and now we're just putting them all over the city um, to use as protective edges as well as seating in the spaces. And then we just have flexible delineators, white lines. Um, and some of our toolkit items are especially made for uh, distinct neighborhoods. That's our meatpacking district. They didn't want our ugly plastic planters, so we developed a planter that fit into the district. And we experimented with all these treatments when we first put them in. Uh, this is an example of a street that we already had closed. We put down all the different colors. We ran a street sweeper over it. Um, we had a kid play on it. Uh, we had a snow plow come and run over it, see how these things would last, see how they would look next to each other um, in order to you know, settle on what we were uh, going to use in the long run. And then the main goal with these projects, besides, um, well, besides the goals I already listed, another goal is to get them into the permanent condition. And here's a project on Allen and Pike Street where we used our toolkit to close uh, underutilized slip roads, uh, connect the existing park median mall, make pedestrian and bicycle connections, uh, reducing crashes with injuries by 18%, and then finding the funding and partnering with the Parks Department to build it out into its permanent condition um, as it exists today. So we set the um, profile and then it became permanent um, a couple years later. And that's it. And this is a great project we have up in um, Columbus Circle, the gateway down Broadway. Um, so yeah, thank you.